I'm Alex Muir and this is a super detailed guide to levelling a floor using self-levelling compound. We'll throw in a few hints and tips and here's a first tip, buckets. These black buckets, you find them everywhere and on the inside there's a scale that shows you your number of litres or gallons and it's pretty hard to read because it's black and it's just kind of slightly embossed on the surface of the bucket. So what I do whenever I buy these buckets, I grab a paintbrush and some white gloss and I just run a bead of white gloss paint up the scale and that means that then when you look at that scale it's really easy to read in any lighting conditions at all. I found myself you know with a normal one of these buckets you're in there with your mobile phone with the torch trying to find oh how many litres have I got in there oh the phone's in the bucket it's inevitably going to happen to me. That makes life a lot easier with these buckets. Let's level this floor. We've got a 42 square meter workshop here with a concrete floor which has just been poured. Now there's two problems, oh by the way, 42 square meters is 420 square feet for our American friends. So this is a good size room to level in. This is a fairly big job if you were DIY leveling. So this floor has a couple of problems with it, with this concrete. One is it's, it's very, very dusty. And what you find is when you've got concrete which has been laid with a little bit too much water, the water rises to the surface and it brings up the cement with it and then you end up with a, a surface coating of water and the water evaporates leaving a kind of dusty powder on the surface and you can see that probably more visibly here and it's got a name which escapes me now uh, give me a second and I'll think of it <sighs> latent so latent is what it is and it, it's this powdery substance which nothing really adheres to basically you want to scrape it up or sweep it up because with a bare concrete floor like this and you don't seal it you'll always have dust rising off this floor and I think people will have experience of never-ending sweeping on a concrete floor and you sweep it and sweep it and the dust still comes up and you sweep it some more and there's more dust so that's what we're trying to solve here obviously the other problem is the floor is not completely even we've got dips and valleys and things across here around five millimeters deep in places so we poured a self-leveling compound and it's going to do two things for us. Firstly, it's going to level this floor and give it a nice finish. Second, it's going to deal with the dust situation. And basically, it's going to seal this floor. Self-leveling compound is relatively cheap. And in fact, I find that it's not much more expensive to just self-level a floor rather than buy concrete sealant, do a few coats of that. Because self-leveling compound gives you that level floor and it's also harder wearing and it's going to last longer. Let's get started. Hi there. I'm leveling a floor. So the first thing you want to do with your floor is just get a straight edge and just run that around the floor, checking at various points to see where's the high spots, where are low spots, and what's the difference between those. Now, if you've just got in one area of the floor, say for example, you've got a hump that's five millimeters high, what you might be best to do is to grind that hump down. Or if you've got small high spots, for example, just chip them off with a chisel because you're gonna have to level the floor to the highest point on that floor. So if there's just one area that's say, for example, 10 millimeters deep, you have to pour 10 millimeters of self-leveling compound across the entire floor to get up to the level of that high point. So if you break that down, then you're obviously gonna save yourself a lot of compound. Once you've assessed the floor and you've worked out what depth of self-leveling you're gonna pour, you can then go and calculate how much you need, how many bags of the, the stuff you're actually gonna need to buy. There's different types of this stuff, but every bag will tell you how many kilograms or pounds of compound is needed per millimeter per square meter. I have no idea what you would use in the US, but in Europe it's per meter squared and per millimeter of depth. So for example, this room is 42 square meters and we want to pour around eight millimeters deep on average across the room. These, this bag tells us that 1.6 kilograms of this powder will fill one millimeter deep one meter square so if you take a one meter square area you put 1.6 kilograms of powder in with some water that will create you one millimeter deep so if we want eight millimeters deep or for, let's say 10 millimeters deep for easy maths 10 millimeters deep across one square meter is going to need 16 kilos of powder and these bags generally come in 25 kilo sacks so you can work out how many sacks you need per square meter. So self-leveling compound itself is a mix of cement and a very fine kind of aggregate, a sharp silica sand or something like that, along with some various additives to make it flow more easily. Something like latex as well to prevent it from cracking. There's all different blends of the stuff. You'll find that for different purposes, there's different stuff. So I'm sure when you go down the store, there'll be 10 or 15 different types of this stuff. Basically, a normal stuff is gonna go about two millimeters deep to 10 millimeters deep. 
that's a typical kind of your bog standard traditional self-leveling compound and then from there you'll find that there's ones that go uh, to create much deeper so up to two inches 50 millimeters deep you'll find a, it's kind of a thicker mix for a, a deeper pour uh, you'll also find faster setting stuff so this uh, is dry to foot traffic in 24 hours you can find very commonly stuff that's dry to foot traffic in four hours and even for commercial projects where people really want to get in and out as fast as possible stuff that's dry within an hour and you can tile straight onto it and when you see this stuff come out it's liquid it's amazing that you can pour it and an hour later you can tile straight onto it and walk on it this stuff you know very normal stuff other ones that you'll find a lightweight mix that you can use in attics for example if you're doing a loft conversion something like that in a property and you're not sure that the timbers the existing building structure structure can bear the weight of a for example a 50 millimeter pour then you can use a lighter weight self-leveling compound which weighs about half as much for around 16 square meters of room you're going to find that, that a traditional self-leveling compound is going to weigh around 2,000 kilos if you use the lightweight stuff that's probably down to a thousand kilos something like that you also find that stuff with higher compressive strength so that's for something like a garage where you're going to have heavy traffic you know heavy load on that floor you want a harder compound so you'll find all these different varieties and then you'll find obviously sub varieties in that hard and fast setting now the thing with setting time is unless you need it to be setting quickly unless you need to be tiling on it the same day then I would suggest grab stuff that doesn't set that quick because you've got a little bit more workability to it there one other thing while I remember you've got to pay attention this stuff's really easy to work with it's kind of idiot proof but if you don't follow the instructions you can't just freestyle it you need to stick to the instructions that means if it says it's for between 2 and 10 millimeters then don't pour it 20 millimeters thick because it's not going to work at that thickness likewise if you buy the stuff that needs to be between say four millimeters and 40 millimeters and you spread it really thin down to one millimeter it's not going to self-level because it's the depth that it's designed to self-level at so the stuff that's for one to ten millimeters is more runny the stuff that's for four to forty millimeters is less runny it's more viscous and so you make it thinner it won't run it won't self-level the other thing that you really need to pay attention to is the amount of water that you mix this stuff with but we'll come to that later bear in mind this is not something like plastering or concreting mixing mortar where you can just eyeball it have a feel of it oh it feels good let's go you've got to follow the instructions on the bags the other thing is use the right primer you know if you can find a primer that matches the product that you're using go for it even if there's an own brand primer on the shelf that's a bit cheaper it's worth sticking with products that you know are going to be compatible with each other because the number one thing is if this floor doesn't go down right for example it cracks or it doesn't adhere correctly to the to the subfloor then we're going to have to chip the whole thing up put it in bags throw it in a skip outside and do the whole thing again so if there's something that's worth doing once and doing right it's laying self leveling in fact it's laying any sort of flooring substrate or any flooring at all really but you know the lower you are in the build the more you're going to have to demolish to correct things if you make a mistake so basically this stuff is idiot proof just follow the instructions okay how does that look so first step is brushing the floor with a brush but this brush is useless it's only good for witches you want a stiff brush stiff bristles like this get stuck in you're not tickling it you really want to lift all the loose stuff off because no matter what you stick down on here even if you were to get super glue and you were to stick something to the floor with super glue here if what you've stuck that super glue to is just dust and it's, it's not actually fixed to the floor it's just dust it's just going to fall off it, it doesn't matter how strong the chemical that you're using is if what you've adhered it to is dust or loose material it's useless you have to get the dust off these floors get stuck in with a stiff bristle brush once you've got most of the loose material off come in with a hoover if you can you know don't use the fine quality miel hoover from the house or you'll be in deep trouble but you know maybe maybe do it anyway we've got plastic fibers in this floor which uh hold the concrete together and give it much stronger you would do that because we didn't want to put mesh in the floor here so you can make things easier when they mix the concrete at the factory they add this uh, these fibers to it and they uh, bond bond the stuff together and prevents it cracking it makes it much stronger because this is around 50 mil thick uh, this screed here now I know that these um, will stick up through the self-leveling compound they almost float up to be vertical as you look at them here you know you wouldn't believe they're going to stick up but I know that once we've poured this we're going to have like a kind of 
a little grass effect every few centimeters there's going to be a little piece of fiber sticking up but that's just the way it is we'll go around with some nail clippers and trim them off or the lawnmower the other thing you need to do for preparation is you need to uh, block off any drains or anything like that any openings in the floor so we've got one here you know we don't want to fill that with self-leveling compounds so polystyrene is always good you could cut this out of a piece of wood or something similar and just make sure that it, it sticks up proud of where your self-leveling compound is going to come to because otherwise you'll go over the top of it and then you'll struggle to find it and have to chip it all away once you've prepped the floor the next step is priming so you're going to want to grab some primer now don't skip the primer step absolutely vital maybe the most important step well they're all important steps but this is a very important step so you'll find different types of primer sometimes they need diluting three to one with water this stuff you just pour it straight in and you'll find these primers the good primers anyway they have a color this one's pink you find green or blue the reason they've got a color in them is that when you paint it on the floor you can see where you've already primed. Easiest thing for me, I, I just tip the whole thing in here, nice big bucket, tip it in there, grab a roller, and just roller it straight out of the bucket all over the floor. Right, now I think we'll get through at least two of these. We've got that stuff out now. Treat yourself to a long handle for your roller. If you just use the actual roller, you know, and you're crouched down and you're rollering like this, it's not fun, it's exhausting. So. A long handle is going to make this much, much faster and also easier on your back. You can make it even easier. You just tip some out on the floor here. We'll just slop some around and then we'll spread it out with the roller. Why are you priming in the first place? Well, there's two reasons why you're priming. You know, everyone knows that you prime to make something stick more easily to the surface below. But the actual main reason that you're priming, or the more important function of the primer, is to slow down the absorption of the water in the mix that you're going to make. What you don't want to happen is a very dry floor like this to suck the water out of the mix. And that leaves no water for the chemical reaction. What's happening here with this stuff, and with, with a lot of chemicals, concrete is a similar situation. It's not drying out. You know, we say, oh, we're going to leave the, the self-leveling compound to dry. You know, as though we're talking about the washing or something that's not what's happening here it doesn't dry the water doesn't evaporate and disappears the water that we add so we take a sack of that we add five liters of water we pour that onto the floor those five liters that we added combine chemically with the compound in the bags to create the hard surface it doesn't evaporate so we don't want it to disappear because if two liters of our five liters get sucked into this floor then the mix is no longer right and the, the actual substance that we've laid won't be that strong. It applies to plaster on the walls equally. So the reason we're sticking down a primer is almost like a varnish. It slows the absorption of the water from the self-leveling compound that we're about to pour onto this into the subsurface. The amount of primer that you're gonna use would depend on how absorbent the floor is. If we were pouring this onto an already sealed floor, for example, we don't need to use too much primer. We don't need to worry too much about it. But uh, when it's very, very absorbent like this, obviously we need to make sure this is primed nicely. Anyway, enough science. So we're almost finished priming the floor here. I'm just gonna work my way out of the door so I don't box myself into a corner. The primer takes, uh, check the pack, but this takes uh, around an hour, an hour and 20 minutes to dry. And it wants to be dry. Don't pour the compound onto a wet primer because what will happen is that wet primer will rise up through the liquid and it will kind of form a surface and leave like a chalky colored deposit on the top, which is not what you want. Certainly we're not what we want because this is gonna be our finished floor in here. For my money, uh, a self-leveling compound is actually the cheapest way to make a finished floor. It's cheaper than tiles, it's cheaper than laminate, it's also a precursor to laminate and tiles, so if you're going to tile or lay laminate flooring you need to self-level the floor anyway. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to pour this, this floor 
and that's going to be our finished floor for a while. And then later, maybe we'll lay some tiles, maybe we'll put some real wood down, maybe we'll just epoxy the floor. But in any of those cases, you need to put the self-leveling compound first. And if you do a self-leveling right, it's actually a nice finish. It's a smooth floor, it's dust free, you can sweep it easily. I'm not going to say you could eat your dinner off it, but I would happily eat my dinner off it. So self-leveling floor, it's not just cheap in financial terms. I would say this is probably going to cost around $5 a square meter or something. In primer, everything, all-inclusive cost. It's cheap in financial terms, but it's also cheap in time because we can lay this whole floor in a day, no problems. Probably half a day, really. And it's cheap in terms of skill. <laughs> that's, that's not a derogative to anybody. You know, if you're laying tiles, for example, it requires skill. And if you're not an expert at it, you're going to work slowly to do it if you're going to get a nice finish. Likewise with laminate flooring, you know, it takes concentration and labor. And really, you know, self-leveling stuff. You prime the floor, you mix it up, you pour it in, it finds its own level. As long as you kind of, you know, have some uh, organization to it, it's easy. It's also uh, cheap in terms of tools. You don't need much to do it. You know, the only real specialist tool you need is a paddle mixer. And you can even just use a, a paddle for a drill. I guess the reason I recommend it, I mean, I don't recommend this for your living room, but if you've got a space that's kind of industrial, a shed, workshop, garage, something like that, this is really an effortless floor to put down. It's cheap. I've seen guys painting using concrete floor paint, which is relatively expensive, painting straight onto concrete. And, and guess what? You know, it doesn't stick very well. It wears away after a year and it looks awful. And the floor is still uneven in the end anyway. Self-leveling stuff, it's kind of a miracle substance for floors. We're ready to start mixing. The primer's dried. We're going to mix up our first batch. What I would suggest is you mix a full bag at a time. Don't attempt to mix a half bag. The maths is easy. The measuring is easy take a full bag at a time uh, that's the way to go a full bag of this takes five and a half liters of water so we want to measure out five and a half liters and we want it exact we want to be well within 10 percent ideally within two or three percent so we don't want five liters we don't want six liters we want exactly five and a half liters what i have here is a bucket now i don't know how much i trust this bucket i've just used it to mix plaster and things and for that sort of thing you're kind of mixing it by feel i'm going to use this kitchen jug to measure out five and a half liters into here and see how accurate it is. That's one litre. Two litres. I'm going to let that settle. I'm going to stick this back in the house before I kick it over and then we'll come back and scribe a line for exactly five and a half litres. So this is settled now and we can see the level. We've put a level on here to make sure the bucket is straight. Exactly five and a half litres have gone in, but the actual level of the water is on the five litre mark exactly. So this bucket is 10% inaccurate, which is no surprise really. First time you buy a bucket like this, just, you know, calibrate your bucket. It sounds crazy, but it's worth the effort. So we know we want to be on the five mark for five and a half litres. We have our water measured out, so we're ready to start mixing. Here's our mixing station. It's kind of well set up. It's organised. It's good to be organised when you're mixing because you want to be productive. You want to be slamming a bag in there, mixing it up, taking it inside, pouring it, getting back and getting another one done because we've got 22 bags to get through here. And that's a fair old number. Our water supply is coming through a hose, which is the easiest way to do this. If you can't use a hose for some reason, then you're going to have a couple of buckets of clean water. Then you're going to have another bucket, which you're using to measure out your mix, which is for us five and a half litres of water. Then we have a big bucket for mixing in because we're going to take a whole bag of this, 25 kilos of that, five litres of water into there. So when this is finished, this is going to weigh 30 kilos exactly. So you need a good bucket. It needs to be clean. These flexi tubs are great for it because once you're finished, you can, you know, clean them up nice and easily. I mean, to be honest, you're going to clean it anyway, but for concreting and things, they're good because you can knock the sides and get the mix off. Unfortunately, the handle's broken on this one, so it's not good for carrying. I've got some other ones, but they've got a uh, ribbed on the interior, which is not for my pleasure because the mix sticks to the inside, which is not ideal, but we'll give them a whirl, see how it goes. Now, with our big bucket, we've also got uh, a trowel here. The reason for that is as we're mixing, the mix, the, the powder will tend to stick to the sides. And we want to just get in there and scrape that off and let it drop. So a big bucket 
and a trowel for cleaning up and scraping down to the bottom. Then we have another bucket here, and this is for cleaning up. So you've got to keep your tools clean as you're doing any sort of work with mud, anything like that, plaster, whatever. You've really got to stay clean. So I have a, a brush in here. I love this brush. Just exactly the right stiffness always helps. The right size, everything about it, brilliant. Just a bit of clean water in the bottom there, and we can stand our mixer in here uh, whenever we're between mixes. You don't want it sitting on the floor, getting dirty, whatever. That is our mixing station. Let's get cracking. Now, I completely forgot to talk about the mixer, which is probably the most important thing here. You really need a paddle mixer for this job, particularly if you were taking on this many bags. If you were mixing up two bags, you can use a drill and a, a paddle, no problem, you'd be all right with that. But for more than that, you really, really want uh, a paddle mixer because you get two hands on there. And when you're looking for one, this one is brilliant because Look at the height here. As I'm working this mixer at the, at the bottom of the pan, I'm not having to bend over. Now I've had previous mixers where it's a lot lower than this, and so you're, you're, you're like this. Oh, that's no good if you're mixing for an hour, two hours out here. Uh, you really want that height so you can keep your back straight and just work this around. This is the right paddle for mixing self-leveling compound. You see that the bars are straight here, and a normal mixing paddle for paint or plaster, whatever, they usually got a spiral shape. Uh, these bars being straight means that air is not being forced in or out of the mix. It's just circulating around, breaking up the powder and mixing it well. You can use the other, the other paddles. It's gonna work for you, but uh, if, you, if you're buying one specially, get the right paddle, and that's this one. Five and a half liters of clean water in the bucket. Water in first, always. Get a bag, rip that open, tip that in there, lovely. That's what we want. Get the mixer, give it a quick up and down. So as you're mixing, you want to get up and down. Get, once you've got a decent mix in there, get up and down and just work the, the powder, which will settle to the bottom, back up to the top, get in the corners. Now once you're almost finished, just take a trowel and just work around the edge of the bucket there and just have a feel around the bottom to make sure you've not missed any huge lumps of goodness down there. This has got a nice creamy consistency. I mean, it's very, very liquid. You're not plastering this stuff on, you're literally pouring it. That's ready to go. Give that a quick been in there. Watch your hands on these mixers. They're actually a very dangerous tool. If you, if you were to spin this with your hand in there or you get your hand caught in that, it's going to do you an absolutely horrific injury. At, at least as bad as a circular saw or anything like that. It's really any sort of mixer like this, the force in that blade, it's just going to mangle your hand up. So just be aware that, you know, it looks pretty tame, but it's actually quite a dangerous tool. I've got here a sack trolley just to save some exertion and I can just wheel this mix down to where I want to pour it because it's about 15 meters and I don't want to carry it. Much easier. So I'm just gonna grab this and just tip this out just slightly away from the wall. We'll let that out. Empty the whole thing. All you're using your trowel for is just to move this stuff around. You're not attempting to smooth it in any way. You're just trying to place it. That's all you're doing. You're just moving it to, you know, encourage it to flow a little bit because this bag let me think, should be 10 kilos per square meter. So this bag of mix should be covering around two square meters. So we wanna encourage this to flow a little bit more to get this out over two square meters. And then we know that we've got our eight millimeters thickness. That's kind of the easy way to estimate this. You know, it's not a precise art. Look how easily that flows. We've got a little lump there. Let's give that a good mix. Another five liters of water. And we're getting the flow now, work our way through the next 21 bags. One more bag. What is important with this is that you work into a wet edge at all times. You can't allow this to dry, go and get your lunch, and then come back and pour the next lot. You need to pour, you know, one continuous pour almost, working your way you know, along keeping it joining into to wet self-leveling compound. So just pour bucket after bucket until you're done. Is there enough for the corner? So where you've got two that have met, you just get the trowel on there and just blend them into one. We want to really flow that back there, cover over some of these horrific bumps. So 
So as you lay each layer, each bucket full, you just want to spread it into the previous layer and just run it around. That's all you're looking to do. Ideally, get the levels of them nice and even. And then there's a tool that I didn't mention earlier, which actually is really useful if you're, if you're doing multiple buckets, like we are, 22 buckets of it, then this is gonna blend the layers into each other or blend the pores into each other. So what you do, once you've spread this around, and that's, you know, that's quite a thick pour, you get a feel for how deep it is. At the, at the edges, you really wanna push it, kind of flow it towards the edges, and then it will flow back into the center of the room. And you can see we've got little raised area where this joins into the previous pour. So we take this spiked plastic brush and just roll it, Nice and quickly, each time we do a pour, we just roll it over the whole thing, but mainly we're aiming for this join. And you can see what happens is it just kind of blurs that, that join. It forces it to flow into every one of these spikes. People think this is for removing air, and I'm sure it helps with that. But what it's really good for is just encouraging that little flow. Here we are, 24 hours later, the floor's dried and it's got this lovely finish on it, almost a, a rubberized coating, which is gonna be great to work on. This is gonna be dust free, easy to keep clean. Now, it's unusual that you would leave this as a finished floor, certainly in a home or somewhere like that, it'd be very unusual to leave this. But for us, for our purposes, this is absolutely great. There's a couple of things which for a finished floor I would have done differently. One of those things is that there are places where we have some raised dots and that's because I rolled this slightly late and the mix had thickened up. And once I rolled it with the spiked roller, those dots kind of stayed raised. Now, if you were tiling on here or laying a finished floor on top of here, absolutely no problem with that. In fact, you know, it might even have better adhesion for your adhesive or whatever like that. But for our purposes, we kind of got this dotted finish. No problem. It's great. I'm delighted.